In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, we read, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but that thou fear the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways, and love him, and serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ is comprised of a diversity of members. You and I, who have different talents, different inclinations, different gifts from Almighty God. And while we receive God's grace, we do not all receive the same graces in the same way at the same time. The First Vatican Council says that in a certain sense, the church is, so to speak, a moral miracle. That is, it is a miracle that the church exists, a miracle of God's grace, a miracle of God's providence, that such a diverse body of believers remains firmly knitted together in faith. People from all walks of life, all cultures, in all ages, speaking different languages, endowed with different points of view regarding so many things. And yet there remains a profound unity in faith. In fact, the very existence of the church is said to be a motive of credibility, evidence of its own divine mission. What other body of believers of whatever creed, has existed in so many places across so many centuries with an unbroken unity of faith. And so we praise God's providence in this profound diversity, this cast of characters whom we call Christians, who God brings together, united in faith, in order to glorify God, in order that we might love God, And yet, the very differences that we see in one another can often be occasions for misunderstanding, for contentions, for petty jealousies, for suspicion, antagonisms, for rash judgment. That's because we are not all made the same. You have heard it here preached before regarding the various temperaments with which human beings are endowed. And it was said in the sermon that those temperaments are organic, that they are part of our physical makeup, part of our sensitive natures. But those are not the only ways in which men differ. In each of us, there are dominant inclinations, ways in which we function, ways in which our souls, as it were, are constituted ways in which God moves us to do his will. These dominant inclinations correspond to various faculties of our soul. And God in his providence seizes upon various faculties of our soul and pours forth his grace into us and moves us in virtue of those faculties to do his will. All of us have the same faculties of our soul, but all of us do not have the same predominant inclinations. And we'll discuss those in a moment. And yet not all of us receive all of God's graces in the same degree, in the same way, at the same time. As St. Augustine says, one man is like this, another man is like something else. Our Lord said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. These dominant inclinations which relate to the faculties of the soul are three in number. And Father Gary Gou Lagrange tells us uh, that these dominant inclinations equate to three paths by which you and I are meant by Almighty God to ascend to the heights of perfection, to ascend the summit of holiness, Three paths which at the base of the mountain, at the moment of our baptism or our entrance into the Holy Catholic Church, three paths which seem divergent. And yet we know the closer we get to the summit, the more those paths converge. The more those paths converge. 
And these three divergent types of holiness are directly related to those three great duties we have before God, which are taught to us in the Baltimore Catechism. You and I know, and we learn in catechism, that we are born into this world and baptized, that we might know, love, and serve God. We were created that we might know, love, and serve God. Three, to know, love, and serve God in this world, that we might be happy with him in the next. And the faculties which predominate in the souls of the saints correspond to these three great duties. And the three faculties of the soul which we wish to discuss today are the intellect, the will, and the memory. The intellect, the will, and the memory. To know God, the intellect. To love God, the will. To serve God, the memory. Being mindful of what God requires of us. In none of us do those three faculties, the intellect, the memory, and the will, function, so to speak, at the same level. In one saint, there is a predominance of one faculty. In another saint, the predominance of another. God, as it were, chooses for us the path to holiness that will lead us most assuredly to the summit of perfection. God knows what is best for us. Grace, since it builds on nature, seizes upon our strongest part, not the part of us which is weakest, but the part of us which is greatest. And God builds upon that. But in doing so, he doesn't ignore the rest of us. He elevates all of our faculties, according to his providence, little by little, until we ascend to the heights of perfection. But even in the saints, these traits these personal traits, these character traits, remain evident. Only when we reach the very summit of holiness do all the saints begin to resemble one another. But along the way, the differences remain apparent. So in some souls, we say the intellect predominates. In some saints, the will predominates. In some saints, the memory predominates. And these three types of holiness, what we might call the way of the intellect, the way of the will, and the way of the memory, are typified, are personified by the three apostles whom our Lord Jesus Christ loved most. Loved most. Peter, James, and John. Recall, of course, that our Lord was constantly taking these three These three characters aside, he loved them with a great predilection. And often he took them apart from the other apostles in order to show them how much he loved them, but also to remind them of their dependence upon him. He took them up to Mount Tabor, as we recalled this week in the liturgy of the Holy Mass of the Transfiguration and gave them a preview of the glory that awaits those who are faithful, gave them a preview of his own glorified body and of the luminescence which God has destined for all of us who are faithful to his will until death. And yet we know that after our Lord had taken them up to Tabor, he brought them back down the mountain to share in his passion and death And in his crucifixion, and we know, sadly, that to a greater or lesser degree, they were often found wanting. Peter, James, and John were with our Lord in the garden during his agony. And we know that the only thing they had on their mind was a bit of rest, a bit of sleep on the very eve of our Lord's passion and death. And in the crucifixion of our Lord ourself, We know, of course, that they weren't as stellar as they should have been. Peter had a very rough time of it indeed. So Father Lagrange sees in these three beloved apostles of our Lord the three types of holiness which we are discussing personified. 
and we will take each one in turn. Saint Peter, the great prince of the apostles, typifies those saints in whom the faculty of the will predominates. Saint Peter was full of ardor of will. He loved God. Saints in whom the will predominates are saints who love God first and foremost. They are moved by a constant upsurge of their heart towards Almighty God. They constantly live to make reparation to God, to see God vindicated, to see God glorified. And they are happy serving God in this way. Sometimes when they are spiritually mature, they will even boast of their desire to love God and to make him loved. St. Peter said, Lord, I will not deny you ever. I will rather go to my death than deny you. And yet we know that St. Peter did exactly that. Saints of this type are filled with fire. They are more heat than light, so to speak. Often their knowledge of the faith is not as broad as it might be, but they have that ardor of will, that ever readiness to serve God. St. Peter was like that, is like that. And yet there are pitfalls to be avoided with this type of saint because while they have great powers of the will with which they might please and serve Almighty God, if they are not careful, they deviate from doing the will of God and they begin to do their own will. Saints of this type, we might give examples, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Margaret Mary, St. Vincent de Paul, saints who in their very early youth conceived first and foremost a love of God. But what are the pitfalls to be avoided with this type of saint? They have to be careful because they are given to self-will, to obstinacy, to stubbornness. They are easily given to judging their neighbor if they are not careful and looking askance at their neighbor. Why doesn't he love God the way I love him? Why is he praying seated when he should be kneeling? Why is he not fasting like I fast? God tries and purifies saints in whom the will predominates precisely through bitter humiliation, like St. Peter, who had to learn by the gravest of sins that he did not love God half as much as he claimed he did. Because saints of this type are easily given to doing their own will or relying upon themselves. Sometimes they lack proper humility. They lack an awareness of their dependence upon God's grace to do good acts. And therefore, God will teach them a lesson or two before they achieve sanctity to remind them that whatever ardor of will with which they are possessed, they are still completely dependent upon God's grace to do those meritorious acts without fail. The second type of saint are those saints in whom the intellect predominates. These are saints not so remarkable for the ardor of their wills, but for the brilliance of their intellect, and not just the natural brilliance with which they are endowed, but the divine light which God infuses in them such that they have a profound understanding of the faith and of its truths. These are saints who are awestruck by God and by his mysteries. They are given to contemplation. These saints are typified by St. John the Apostle, the great evangelist who wrote so lovingly and so knowingly about the divinity of our Lord, about the nature of the Blessed Trinity, about the science of sanctity in his epistles. These saints are more light than heat. And they are typified by the doctors of the church. We might think of the great St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Francis de Sales, St. Anselm, great minds who understand, as it were, almost with a single glance, the profound truths of our faith and who take delight in them. These saints, of course, have very much to offer you and I 
by way of their teaching. But if they are not careful, there are pitfalls for them too. They sometimes lack the order necessary to overcome their own weakness in terms of their conduct. They fail to practice what they preach or to put into action the truths which they so clearly see. They understand God better than anyone, but they have a very hard time serving him as they ought. They spend too much time in their books and not enough time on their knees. St. Francis de Sales lamented this tendency in himself and strove by God's grace to overcome his weakness. And of course, we know he became a great saint. We might say that some saints, by the way, are so blessed by God that in them, both the faculty of the will and the intellect find a certain predominance. Such saints, St. Paul the Apostle, St. John the Evangelist, whom we are discussing, St. Benedict, St. Dominic, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, saints who seem to have both keenness of intellect and ardor of will in equal measure, great saints, profound saints, who from their earliest youth understood God and loved him perfectly. But in most of us, one faculty or the other predominates. The last type of saint are those saints who go, as it were, by way of the memory, the memory. And they are personified by St. James the Greater, the brother of St. John, the first martyr among the apostles, the great apostle to the Spanish nation. St. James typifies those who sometimes have neither the depth of understanding of our faith as other saints, nor the ardor of will. But they have a good memory, and they are ever mindful to the duties of their state. The Holy Spirit teaches them amidst a multitude of occupations what is to be done here and now in order to know God, to love him, and to please him, in order to be attentive to the needs of their neighbor and to give God glory. What to do? They always remember the duties of their state. And they are typified by St. James, about whom we know relatively little, who left us no great writings, who left us very little testimony of himself in the gospel, but who nevertheless did God's will daily, even to the shedding of his blood. These are saints who, remembering what they're meant to be doing and following through with it, please God greatly. And they are saints wholly given, it seems, to practical activity. They're mindful of the needs of their neighbor, of the duties of the state, and they execute those things faithfully. Saints of this type, we might think, of course, of St. James, who we've just mentioned. Also, the venerable Louis and Zélie Martin, the parents of St. Therese, of the child Jesus. Married people whose causes for canonization are going forward. So renowned for their sanctity are they that because of the holiness of their lives, they gave all five of their adult children all five of their daughters to the religious life by their example, by their prayers, by their penances, by their complete resignation to the will of God and by being mindful to the duties of their state, they gave all five of their adult daughters to the holy religious life. Great examples of saints of this type. These saints, too, however, have great pitfalls which they must overcome by God's grace. Saints of this type can easily become too attached to their own way of doing things, to exterior practices, both of prayer and penance. I have to say this litany every day or I won't be a saint. I have to pray in this posture and never in this posture. I have to pray now not later, has to be done at this time. God will hold me to it. 
Saints of this type sometimes are only given to vocal prayer and do not make adequate time for silent meditation, for one-on-one conversations with Almighty God. Saints of this type also are easily given to scandal. They easily are perturbed by the faults and failings of their neighbor and become disheartened whenever they see or experience anything which seems not to be of God. They are easily disheartened by obstacles which others place in their path on their way to the summit of perfection. So these are the three types of saints which God calls into his kingdom. Those who are called to go, as it were, by way of the will. Those who are called to go, as it were, by way of the intellect. Those who are called, as it were, by way of the memory. But none of these saints become saints or get to heaven without God's grace, perfecting all of their faculties, elevating, healing the wounds of original sin, and ennobling their faculties, that they might clearly come to a profound knowledge and love of God and serve him faithfully. These three forms of holiness are all found to a supereminent degree in the sacred soul of our divine Savior, our Lord Jesus, and also to a very high degree in the soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary. While saints begin life looking and seeming very different, and while sometimes in the midst of their spiritual journeys, those differences are set in bold relief, nevertheless, as they reach the summit of perfection, even in this life, Saints begin to resemble one another. They begin to resemble one another. And as we become saints, you and I, we begin to resemble more and more our Lord and our Lady. We are, after all, as Christians, configured in a special manner to our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are different paths to holiness but they lead to the same summit of perfection. And saints, as they become more perfect, begin to resemble one another. They begin to resemble our Lord and our Lady. Such is the spiritual path which God has called us all to, union with Jesus and Mary. We might think of the great St. Alphonsus Liguri, who seems to typify in certain ways the three paths to holiness. He was endowed with a keen intellect. He had a profound light by which he understood the mysteries of our faith. But he also cultivated a profound love of God, profound love of God. And yet he was gifted with an extremely practical memory, mindful of the needs of so many souls. He wrote so many lovely treatises written precisely for the edification of the lay faithful, that they might make their way to holiness. He was, despite being a genius, an extremely practical man, mindful and always remembering the needs of his neighbor. So let us ask the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mediatrix of all graces, to obtain for each one of us the desire for holiness, the desire for the holiness to which God has destined us, Not the holiness of our neighbor, not the holiness of our brother or our sister, but the holiness which God has destined for us. Let us ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to obtain for us that desire, and also that we might desire the means to obtain it. Next week we will discuss the means to holiness and discuss how we might ask Almighty God in his mercy to grant them to us. May God bless you all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.